Talia, I talked to many philosophers about free will. I like that stuff. And I uh, hear terms like libertarian, can do otherwise, compatibilism. Mm -hmm. You're a neuroscientist, right. not a philosopher, but you focus on free will. How can what you do help philosophers understand what they do? <laughs> well, I think they would argue that uh, I have to understand them better as well. But um, I think we all have to come to an agreement. Uh, we all have to understand each other's positions. And as a neuroscientist, I would argue that you have to have a biologically plausible theory of free will. That, you know, it's 100 billion neurons. And so explain to me how you get free will out of a neuron that's not choosing whether to fire. It's just getting input and firing. Mm -hmm. And so... You've got to you've got to reconcile these views of free will with something that's a lump of warm, wet matter in the brain. It, it sounds like that philosophers need to be more in tune with what you're doing than you with what they're doing. <laughs> that's a loaded. Of course, I'm going to agree with you, <laughs> right? Um, I would I would say that it yes, they have to they have to take into account the findings from neuroscience. I think they would argue strongly against that position, but yes, as a neuroscientist, that's what I believe. So they have to account for what's happening in the brain, for sure, whereas you can do your work without worrying about how they define all these uh, arcane terms. Right, I think so, um, <laughs> without understanding the terms very well. Um, I, I don't quite understand compatibilism. I know that that is a, a favorite among philosophers where um, they feel like they can have free will and yet have a completely physically realized system. To me, I, I don't quite understand that as a neuroscientist. Because from the neuroscience point of view, you're just doing your experiments and they are what they are. And right. so however, if somebody else wants to define free will, I mean, it's a separate it's a separate issue. Right. So what are some of the experiments that you do, particularly more recently with hypnosis, et cetera, right. that, that really affect uh, how philosophers need to think about what neuroscience is, is, is showing? Well, I think what we've shown um, empirically now is that you can um, cause someone to do an action without them feeling any kind of sense of free will, and yet they did it intentionally, um, it was their decision, and yet they have no sense of free will. If that is the case, and we've demonstrated scientifically that that can occur, then the onus is on them to explain, then what is free will? What is that sense of having free will doing? And is it illusory? Is, is it causal? And, and, and how would it be causal? Because you're creating exactly the same results. Uh, the behavior for sure, right. the internal cause, the, the internal volition to make it happen, e everything you're causing, you've just eliminated this personal sense of right. personal doing it. And, right. and how have you done that? Um, well, we did that using post-hypnotic suggestion. So we hypnotized highly hypnotizable individuals to, um, to react to a cue. And so we said, you know, whenever you see a red triangle on a computer screen, you will decide um, within the next 20 seconds to squeeze a ball in your hand. And you won't, you won't remember any of this, um, but that's what, that's what you will do. And then we woke them up, and we sat them in front of a computer screen, and the red cue appears, and they, lo and behold, squeeze the ball. Um, sometime they, during that 20 seconds. Sometime during that 20 seconds. And they never do it right away. Um, they do it about the same interval of time they would normally. Um, and what's interesting is that they don't have any agency, any feeling of will while they're doing it. Um, now, to, to stop them from sort of freaking out that their hand keeps doing that and them not knowing why, we gave them a cover story. So before we sat them in front of the screen that would show the red triangles, we told them that we'd put electrodes on their arm um, and a current sometimes builds up and causes a contraction, and we're very sorry that this might happen, and I hope it isn't too uncomfortable, but if it happens, it's no big deal. Um, and that's exactly what happened. They would, they would see themselves squeeze the ball because they intended and volitionally made that action, and yet they would explain it to us later by saying, oh, I saw what you meant about the electrodes. I could mm -hmm. see my hand contracting. Mm -hmm. And so that decoupled, as it were, 
right. uh, the feeling of uh, I'm in control of this making the decision. From, and the actual. And the actual behaviors right. and internal, something's happening internally to, to make them do that. That's right. But they're just not aware of what that is and it's, it seems totally decoupled. That's right. That's right. So we can dissociate the feeling of doing from the actual doing. Mm. And uh, what's the implication of that? Well, the implication is, well, what is the feeling important for, right? If, if you can excise that feeling of doing from doing and doing just unfolds as it normally would and you're making the decisions, then why do we have the feeling? Why do we have that sense of being the decider in the moment? What's that feeling giving us? Well, two questions there. One is, it, what is it giving us? What's it doing for us, whether personally or evolutionary or whatever? Mm -hmm. and, and, and the second is, is it doing anything? Right. Uh, is, it, is it contributing to the, beha uh, the behavior in the moment? That's right. Um, well, we know that at least with simple actions, it doesn't seem to be doing much. Now, whether that scales up to complex actions, uh, distal intentions, et cetera, we, we don't know. But at least for these relatively small movements, you can decide to make that movement and you don't need to know that you're doing it. What was the process in coming up with hypnosis as a key driver to discern the underlying reality of the readiness potential? Right. Um, well, we decided upon hypnosis because we wanted a way to decouple the feeling of doing from the doing. And I'd used hypnosis in some other work. Uh. So I knew that you could get people to feel things and do things without sort of a sense of uh, control, of a, a sense of authorship for their actions. And we thought, well, this would be a really useful way to figure out whether if you could uh, induce someone to make an action and see whether or not uh, the readiness potential would unfold naturally, even when that person had no inkling mm, that mm. they were deciding to act at that moment. So it was, a, it was a key opportunity, a useful tool for this very question. Did everybody agree with you or did some of your colleagues disagree how important it may be, at least Actually, initially? Uh, initially we, we thought we wanted to, well, it would be nice if we didn't have to resort necessarily to hypnosis, but it's very difficult to, to figure out a way to decouple the feeling of doing from mm. doing. I mean, mm. whenever we do something, we feel that we are authors of our actions. So decoupling those two is quite tricky. Mm. And so hypnosis seemed like um, an opportunity that just doesn't exist in nature, mm. in, a, in a sense, mm. to be able to do it. And during the process, uh, what were your own uh, emotions, high, lows? Uh, uh, <laughs> this is a very, it was a very tricky, it was a, there was a lot of work involved. Uh, many iterations of different studies, different um, paradigms, do we try this, do we try that, things that worked, things that didn't work, um, trying things again and again. Um, even with the hypnosis paradigm, different setups of what, how were we going to make them what kind of action were we going to make them do? How is that going to play out? What was the cover story going to be? Um, there are all sorts of individuals that we tried to hypnotize to do um, the action, and they would do the action, but they had memory for why they were doing it. They would remember, oh, I did this because you, you had told me. Even if they felt involuntary at the time, they had had memory, and so that, well, that doesn't, that doesn't count. Describe why that wouldn't count, because it, they, they, see, they feel themselves doing it without, without volition. That's right. But they remember that you told them to do it without volition, yeah. that being the difference. But they still did it without no, volition. No, I agree. I agree. I think, it, I think they should count. But we wanted the purest <clears throat> case for, for, for skeptics. We wanted the purest <clears throat> case of, here's an individual that is deciding to move their hand and they have no sense that they made that decision. In fact, um, they will, will tell you that it was, it was the electrodes, and they're even surprised by, wow, I saw what you were talking about with the elect, right? That's a pretty good, that's pretty good evidence that they really lacked a sense of mm -hmm. authorship mm -hmm. in the moment. What were some of your frustrations during the project? Uh, just the fact that we had to, um, we had to screen so many people to try to find highly hypnotizable subjects um, that even when we got all the electrodes on that, uh, you know, they would remember the cue, you know. So um, just the hypnosis itself is quite, um, 
it's quite fatiguing uh, as being the person to <laughs> hypnotize someone, which is uh, strange in its own way. And so, and then we went from 32 electrodes and thought, well, we should get more electrodes, put on 64. And um, there are just lots of moving parts to this. At, at, at the whole, this is a, a big project, multiple studies. I think we conducted something like 12 different studies. Um, it took a, a lot of time, but we're very proud of it. After all this time you took and you winnowed it down to just a few, it, does, does it concern you that you have such few pure data points right. that, that can, that, uh, on which you're building this giant superstructure? Right. Um, yes and no. I mean, I understand that argument, but then I look at um, patient, you know, patient HM, who you know is right. one guy who you know who <laughs> lost his uh, you know, uh, hippocampi, and um, that was very important for us to understand how memory worked, right? Or split brain patients. You've got two people who um, got uh, you know they cut their corpus colossum so that their hemispheres are, are separated. That taught us a lot about lateralization mm -hmm. of function, right? And so you see these case studies in the literature that explain a lot about how normal brain function works. Mm -hmm. And these guys aren't even patients, right? These are normal mm -hmm. college students walking around. Now, granted, not everybody is highly hypnotizable. And so there's something unusual, by definition, really, about their brain. But we don't think it's so unusual that it isn't telling us something about normal brain function. Your colleagues in uh, neuroscience, uh, or philosophy for that matter, as they're uh, viewing uh, kind of preprints of, uh, or, or, or uh, presentations that you're making of this data, what are some of the criticisms that you're receiving? Well, I think the major criticism um, is that, okay, so we don't have free will for this or this. So what? I, I still have to decide whether or not I'm going to call, go to college or who I marry or you're not showing me anything, uh, any consequential decisions that um, might actually require free will. You're just showing me that you can cause people to squeeze a ball and not know that they're doing it. The difference between, as they say, picking where it doesn't matter and choosing right. where it matters between the alternatives. And your answer to that? Um, my answer to that is it's a start. And, and they have to accept that this is data. And so whatever theory you have about free will, you have to accommodate the fact that you can excise free will from something as small as this. And now the onus is on them to t show me how you know, deciding whether or not to go to college is fundamentally different from deciding when to squeeze a ball. It might be, but we, we don't know how. It sounds like you've shifted the burden of proof more in their direction. Is that right? Uh, I hope so. I'd love to see. I mean, I, I actually don't, uh, as much as people like to think I have a, a very strong agenda or view or something about free will, I actually would love for it to be true that consciousness plays a, you know, a causal role in our conscious experience of free will, that what it feels like to be a normal human being acting in the world is actually somehow causal. It just things. ain't true. <laughs> I would just love for that to be true. And if someone proved that it was true, if someone proved that our subjective experience is actually causal of behavior, and great, you know, that, I, that would make everything seem to be right in the universe, right? <laughs> it just hasn't happened yet. And we seem to, we keep trying to find it. And I don't know why it's so elusive, right? And you do know why, in your opinion, because it doesn't exist. Well, I think we don't have evidence yet. That's an absence of evidence, not an evidence of absence issue, right? 